and welcome to Dumber and Dumber. I'm Tommy Vance, you're not, and you're never gonna be. Come on then! Tonight's program is a stunt special featuring deranged daredevils risking it all for cheap or sometimes quite expensive thrills. Tonight, these flyboys take a car for a drive in the air. A mad biker meets his fans. A stealth bomber, uh, bombs. And an extreme skier gets extremely sore. These days, aerial stuntmen of the sky have to push the envelope a bit to get the attention of a jaded public. This extreme edge started with sky surfing, the mad brainchild of photographer Joe Jennings. When you understand the sport and you've been in it for a while, you, you understand that uh, there are inherent risks. Um, it's not a sport that I would call safe. You know, if you want safe, you can go to an amusement park or you can go take a stroll in the park. I mean, that's relatively safe. Not content with hanging five at 10,000 feet, these crazy, wonderful loons have come up with a new twist, sky driving. Four stuntmen are strapped in a car and ejected out of a plane. Then they go for a bit of a drive before jumping out of the car and parachuting to safety. Unless, of course, they get stuck in the car. The second cameraman tries to help the trapped stunt dude, but the car slams into him at 130 miles an hour. At the last possible moment, the trapped stuntman releases himself from the plummeting Skoda, with just seconds to spare before the crash landing. It didn't take long for stuntmen and daredevils to work out the formula. One, the more spectacular smash-ups, the more bums on seats. Big-time crashes mean stadium owners everywhere can large it up on the profits. Sure, the punters like to see flying cars, but they love a good wreck. So why jump over nothing in a jam jar? when you can leap over three prissy white school buses in the Darth Vader of school buses. Or take to the air in a motorhome and clear a stack of portaloos. Crowd pleases all of them, of course, but these stunts don't always go to plan. Firebird Lake, Arizona, a stuntman with the refreshingly stupid name Spanky Spangler is out to best the world car jumping record. Up the ramp and then jump in the lake. That's the plan. The impact rips off the hood of the car, caves in the car's windshield, and botches Spanky's emergency oxygen system. As the car sinks, Spanky gets trapped without an air supply. His wife, Mrs. Candy Spangler, watches helplessly. The rescue team begin diving for the Spankster, but his motor's upside down and crushed. After more than three minutes, the rescue team appears, with the proud holder of a new world record looking well, spanked. Joe Reed is a motorcycle stuntman who likes to make things interesting for himself by leaping over large, prickly objects. This dangerous man will now attempt to jump over three powered helicopters. During a practice run, jumping over a mere two whirly birds, Reed loses control when he touches down. He's rushed to the hospital, but he's back and more than ready for action later the same day. The slightest miscalculation of distance, and he could be sliced and diced on the blades of a chopper, a mistake that can only mean certain death for this admirably bonkers biker. The doctors say Reed is as well as he'll ever be, so he's off. The slow-mo replay shows Reed clearing the blades of the chopper by less than a foot. This jump put Reed into the major league of motorcycle daredevils. There is no obstacle I will not jump. There is no distance I will not fly across. 
and I think that sets me apart from a, a lot of other so-called motorcycle jumpers. The ever-modest mullet head takes motorcycle jumping to new heights, attempting a solo rooftop to rooftop jump over six stories high. But it's a long way to the top if you want to be a proper chopper hopper, and that's more of a crash landing than a touchdown. So Reed decides to do it once more, and this time he's teamed up with fellow nutter Johnny Airtime. I really didn't think he made it. I didn't look until I actually landed on the other side, went into the net. Did I get back up and look around for him? He was right there with me. I don't know how he got across, but he almost got killed. Oh, that was informative. Not satisfied with this brush with death, Reed up the ante for the next stunt. Boy Racer's plan was to jump over four high-powered wind machines. These gigantic fans spin at around 10,000 RPM. Too easy, says Joe Reed, who accepts an amazingly stupid schoolyard dare. I said that I would do this motorcycle jump with one arm tied behind my back. That's what this is. So, with his left arm strapped behind his back and his instinct for self-preservation at half-mast, Reed wobbles uncertainly into history. <laughs> Result! Two fans are destroyed, and the left-hand side of his motorcycle is shorn off. This replay shows that Reed actually slows down on his way to the launch ramp. He lands on the third fan and bounces into the center of the fourth. That slices cleanly through the left handlebar. Ironically, and a half, it's only because Reed had one arm behind his back that he survived. If he jumped in the traditional two-handed way, his left arm would have been severed. Instead, he walked away. <laughs> Urban parachutist Jessica Klutmeyer has decided to jump from the top of the Seattle Space Needle. Yes, they're all crazier in the city of Frazier. But her shoot gets in a twist. Unable to free her cords, she goes crashing to the ground. The slow-mo replay shows that her chute didn't open completely, and just as her life flashed in front of her eyes, she hit the dirt. It was like, thank God, I'm, I'm coming down over the ground. OK, I'm coming down, I'm slowing down the spin. There's the pavement. Good, I'm not, I knew that I would not hit the pavement. Falling on the soft, wet ground actually saved her bacon. You'll observe that she bounces when she hits the turf. The paramedics get her to the closest Starbucks, whoops, I mean hospital, quick as they can. With just one broken bone in her back, Jessica's not seriously hurt, but her ego might need some therapy. Call Dr. Crane. I'm like, this sucks. I did this in front of a big crowd of people, but I'm gonna be all right. <laughs> Two, one, he's away. Just as this ski man traverses at the top of his run, the tip of his ski gets caught in the snow, and he loses his balance. The voices you will hear are from the intellectual giants behind the camera. Oh, oh no! No. Oh. He's in big trouble. Oh, right over here. Yeah. He's got to be hurt. Oh! Right at the bottom of the... He's out. He's got to be hurt. We need serious help up there. He just needs to be conscious. He is moving. He's picked up his head. When stunt skiers fall from dramatic heights, they're taught to go completely limp and go with a fall like a bunny full of Valium. This guy flips 13 times, lucky for some, smashing up against five jagged rock outcroppings along the way. In addition to multiple cuts and lacerations, he also sustains a compound fracture of his left leg. There's a risk in pretty much anything that you do, I guess. It's all calculated, you know. As far as my crash, you know, it, it was a bad one, but, uh, 
I don't, I don't think it should hold anybody else back. And, you know, I'll still be skiing. I'll be out there. After the break, we've got boats that fly, cars that crash, and bikers that bail out. Again, I'm Tommy Vance, and you're still not. Welcome back to the show that stuck-up, sticky beak intellectuals love to hate. But baby, we don't care. <laughs> Your sea devil loves nothing more than messing about in boats. But in the high-speed, high-octane world of powerboat racing, accidents will happen. Travelling at speeds in excess of 200 miles per hour, the smallest wave can really blow them away. In between heats of a big boat race, hydro stuntmen put on a show for the landlubbers back on the shore. Ah! These stunt skippers actually intend to abandon ship instead of manfully going down with it. But it's during an in-between races spraffing session that things really go aquatically wrong. The Missy Lamb is a new hydroplane design built with extra weight on the front, so if caught in a bit of air, it wouldn't flip. That was the plan, and it would have worked if the extra weight of the fatheads hadn't caused the front to dip at the exact moment of impact. Skipper Ken Dryden suffered some serious damage. At that point, it sheared the cockpit up right about leg level, and I received uh, seven broken bones in my legs and three bro broken vertebrae in my back. Once the boat gets in the air, you've got, in that particular boat, we probably had seven to 10 seconds before from the point of lifting off to the impact. You've got time to shut the motor down. I had time to take my fingers, let go of the steering wheel, tuck them inside my shoulder harnesses. Just about busted all my fingers doing it. But that's uh, what saved my hands, because the whole cockpit came off and flipped down and underneath the boat, and the boat still had forward momentum. That's what broke my legs, folded my legs back underneath the boat. Those are some pretty smart reactions from someone who's otherwise completely unwell above the neck. Stunt driver Brian Carson isn't the son of a car, but he has been performing crash stunts since the early 70s. It started out as a way to meet girls, but he's been lucky so far not to meet his maker. Now, this may look like an accident, but it's all part of a plan. As intended, his name landed right side up. His stunts even impressed veteran movie stuntmen, like this Christopher Walken lookalike. Myself as a stuntman and other stuntmen I know who have gone and watched Brian will kind of sit there and go, holy mackerel. <laughs> you know, like, wow. Because a lot of stuntmen have never seen things like Brian does. Because we don't do them quite that big. You know, there are all those occasions, but a lot of times Brian has done stuff and I've sat and shook my head and wondered there's no way that he can get out of that car and he'll pop out. Dodge City, Kansas was the first place that Carson attempted a dodgy, long distance exploding car jump. Right now, it looks like the only way he's getting out of Dodge is in an ambulance. He's missed the cars by a country mile, and his own vehicle doesn't have the elaborate cage that protects him. Brian was seriously injured. My wheels spun, and I lost four to five miles an hour. Uh, I came in short, and actually, I crashed in the worst possible way that I could have doing a car stunt like this. 
I couldn't do this if I tried in a million years. I went frame to frame with the first car. I didn't hit bef before the cars. I didn't overshoot the cars. I went metal to metal with the first framed car, and I took all the impact myself. It took the medics an hour to pull him from the wreckage, but Carson's no quitter and is soon attempting yet another sky crash. This time, the plan is a simple one. Drive off a 10-story car park in Vegas and land in the catch cars below. This, amazingly, is Carson's oldest dream. It should have stayed one. The method behind the madness involves landing in the right spot. Too short or too long or to either side would mean a one-way ticket to that big speedway in the sky. The worst way to land would be upside down. And that, folks, is exactly how he landed, upside down. Fire explosions! Fire! Upside down and trapped, and with fuel leaking from the car, Andily located for all that fire. If we can smell fuel big time. The car could hit the, the targeted landing cars, but be in the worst possible position, which is upside down on its roof which, again, allows the least amount of the protection of the cage we built. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. We landed at over 85 miles an hour upside down on our roof. But the most failed of failed stunts for Brian Carson took place in Charlotte, North Carolina. In front of 175,000 southern good old boys, the Duke of Hazardous was out cold for 40 minutes. Uh, even though I had the speed to clear the trucks, the suspension broke, the front suspension of the car. And it, the car went vertical in air, so it lost all its momentum. And it landed in the worst possible spot on that trailer, right in a pyrotechnic mortar that was being detonated as I was landing on it. Tonight on Worst Possible Spot, our star guest is Brian Carson. You know, they want to see you get close to the edge. They want to see someone risk it all, but not go over the edge. The, the, the folks don't want to bring out their kid and go, hey, look, Billy Bobby splattered himself all over the truck. You know, they're there to see someone pull off something that's really dangerous, but walk away. I don't think anybody wants to see uh, someone get badly mangled or uh, even killed. I don't think that's the, the draw, but uh, you know, there's an adage I firmly believe. I believe 95% of the people there want to see you get close but not go over the edge. But there's always that 5% that are up there that are bloodthirsty. Uh, you know, they, they like the kind of people that go to bullfights and root for the bull to win. I know they're up there too. Every time Brian does a stunt that goes south, he says, that's the last time I'm getting mixed up with a stunt like that. But it never is. We're back at the Carolina racetrack with motorcycle daredevil Doug Danger. He's about to do a practice jump for a world record attempt of 249 feet. Doug wipes out on the landing. The slow-mo replay reveals Mr. Danger was going less than the recommended takeoff speed of 105 miles an hour. The flight over was perfect, but because of the slower speed, he lands short on the runway, flipping him over the top of his bike. He breaks two arms, his left leg, and some vertebrae, and he's still considered lucky. Now we take the plunge to Sydney, Australia, where lady biker Polly Wynn has a fine idea for a stunt, jumping out over Sydney Harbour on a motorcycle. Hmm, that went well. The feisty Sheila accelerates too much at the bottom of the takeoff ramp. Over 700 cardboard boxes have been tied together to absorb the shock of the landing. But because she's built up so much speed, she's lurching way past the safety zone. In flaming credibly, she has no major injuries. Niagara Falls, considered by stunt persons to be the big thing of scary challenges. 
For years, it was the dream of stuntman Steve Trotter to go over the side in a high-tech wooden barrel. Of course, he didn't want the missus to miss out, so he brought along girlfriend Laurie. In the history of the falls, they've become only the fourth and fifth people to survive such a stunt, but it's only whetted their appetite for danger. Yankee airman Major Brian Knight loops the loop in his stealth fighter as an air show crowd of 10,000 crick necks look on. The first two passes are the business, but on the third, and what turns out to be the final pass, the left wing of the 30 million quid airplane disintegrates. I'm not so sure it's meant to do that. The Major bravely decides to stay in the cockpit and try to steer the plane away from the crowd. At the very last instant, the plucky pilot ejects and the plane goes into free fall. Meanwhile, across town, the McDonald family are eating mom's apple pie. Suddenly, the suburbs get bombed like it's the Blitz. The stealth fighter crashes and burns, but miraculously, no one is hurt and the pilot survives. At a speedway in Southern California, dragster driver Hans Krussel loses control of his car. Following a perfect start, Krussel's left wheel tire loses its grip, causing him to swerve wildly to the left at 185 miles an hour. He tries to correct his direction, but his trip terminates on the guardrail, and his jam jar bursts into flames. Bouncing on the guardrail from left to right, his motor is ripped to shreds. Krussel unfastens his safety harness and walks away with only slight concussion. Well, looks like he'll be back and twice as bad, and so will I. So catch you next time, danger fans. Till then, stay dumb. You know it makes no sense. And next time is actually after the break when we get the chance to catch the first series of Dumber and Dumber, which proves that none of those taking part has gained any intelligence at all.